Kia ora tato. Um, in this lecture we're going to go a little bit more abstract because we need to develop some core concepts that we sort of touched on a bit earlier in the course. So we looked briefly at spans of vectors before when we learned about linear independence. So remember that the span of a set of vectors, which we can write as the span of u1, u2 through to um, u where the u's are themselves in Rn, is just the set of all possible linear combinations of those vectors themselves. Um, it turns out that these sets of vectors are actually the spans are pretty fundamental and they are known as subspaces of Rn. So we need to, in this video we're going to figure out what we kind of mean by that, uh, what these things are. But before we do that we're going to try and get a bit of an intuitive feel for what's going on first. So the key idea behind subspaces um, is that when we take vectors inside a subspace, if we add them, subtract them, or scalar multiply them, basically we don't end up leaving the space. So don't think of them in terms of spans just yet. Think of the main idea as just that. If we add, subtract, or scalar multiply, then we stay inside our subspace. You could also say, if you want to use some slightly more ma mathematical language for that, you could say that the space is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Okay, so let's just to get our first head around it a little bit, let's look at the xy plane in R3 as being our first example of a subspace. So let's just look at it visually for now. So here's a sketch of what we're looking at. We've got our xy and z axes, and we have the xy plane, which is just z equals zero, um, shaded in here. So if we take two vectors on the plane, which I'll draw with arrows, then when we add them together, we end up staying on the plane. We can't come up with any combination of vectors that makes us leave, that makes us go up or down in the z direction. Also, if I stretch any of these vectors out by scalar multiplication, we likewise do not actually leave our plane. So this is kind of the key idea here. Now, if we keep thinking along the lines of subspaces in R3, there are some others as well. Um, so other examples of sub subspaces that live inside R3 are, for example, lines through the origin. Um, any plane through the origin, and in fact R3 itself is a subspace of R3. They had to go through the origin because we decided that scalar multiplication is not allowed to exit us from the subspace, so if I take my scalar to be 0, then 0 times a vector x um, is going to be the 0 vector, so our origin has to be in our subspace. So the right intuition for a subspace is, think of it as like a flat thing or a flat or a straight thing that goes through the origin inside your space. So in R3 the flat and straight things are planes, lines and I guess R3 itself, but we're now going to get a wee bit more mathematically precise about this. So let's state the definition of a subspace and it's just essentially what we said before. So let S be a set that's contained within Rn, that's what that symbol means. If the following two properties hold, first one is that U plus V is in the subspace S whenever U and V themselves are in S. And number two, A times U is in S whenever A is a scalar and U is itself in S, then we call S a subspace of Rn. So in order to test that something is a subspace, we need to check that the two properties both hold for it. So we'll illustrate that with a couple of examples. We'll start with the one We'll start with the xy plane in R3 that we just looked at before. So first example, show that the xy plane is a subspace of R3. So let's check the first property first. We need a way of picking two arbitrary vectors on the plane. So let's let u be x1, y1, 0. Hopefully you're comfortable that's a vector on the xy plane. And v will be a possibly different one, x2, y2, 0. Then what we have to do is we have to add them up and show that our result is still in the same form. So u plus v is just going to be x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2, and 0. And that is quite clearly also a vector on the xy plane. So we've satisfied the first condition. See how tests and the conditions work? We just choose two representative points and check that their sum is still in the set that we defined. So to test the other one, we're going to choose a scalar, let it be a, then a times u will be a times the vector x1, x2, 0, which I can bring that a inside by scalar multiplication, will be ax1, ax2, and 0. 
This is likewise still a vector on the plane. So now we can say that the plane is definitely a subspace because the two properties have been satisfied. Okay, that's cool. So we've kind of got the feeling for how that one works. Now we're going to move on to one that is a bit more abstract, but it's pretty fundamentally important. So our next example is to show that the span of a set of vectors is a subspace. So let S be the span of M vectors U1, U2 through to Um, where the vectors are themselves all in Rn. Just note the difference between the M and the N here. We want to show that this set is a subspace of Rn. So to test the first subspace property, we need to choose two arbitrary items in our set. So we can do it like this. We're going to let x be a1 u1 plus a2 u2 through to am um all added up. So I've just taken a scalar, uh, sorry, linear combination of the u vectors. And then y needs to be a different linear combination. Well, it could be the same, but it needs to have different letters. y is b1 u1 plus b2 u2 all the way through to bm um. So these are our two vectors that we want to, want to check. Now we need to show that when we add them up, we can still express the answer as a lin linear combination of the ui vectors. So here goes. x plus y, well that just, is just going to be a1 plus b1 times u1, plus a2 plus b2 times u2, through to am plus bm times um. This expression is itself a linear combination of the u's, which is what we wanted. So we've satisfied our first property. We then need to check scalar multiplication. So let's choose a scalar k to be in R. Then k times x is equal to k times a1 u1 plus a2 u2 through to am um. And that's itself equal to k a1 times u1 plus k a2 times u2 all the way through to k a m times u m. And this is also in the right format as a linear combination of the u vectors. So we've satisfied the second property. And this means that the span of our vectors is definitely a subspace of Rn. So that's cool. So now we're cooking with gas. All right, now when we first met the span, we alluded to the fact that some of our vectors might actually be redundant. We might not need the whole lot in order to build that whole space. So it's time to be a bit more precise about what we meant. We've got a bit more language and concepts that we can work with now, so we can define what we mean by a basis of a subspace. So here's the definition. We're going to take S to be a subspace of Rn, then a set U1 through to Uk is a basis of S if, firstly, the set of vectors U1 through to Uk is linearly independent, and secondly, the s the set s is the span of those u vectors so the main difference between the span of a regular set of vectors and the span of a basis is that the vectors must be linearly independent if these properties are true we say that s is a k dimensional subspace of rn now no matter what basis we come up with it will actually always have k vectors in it so k expresses the dimension of the subspace Seems like we're using the word dimension a bit differently now, but it's actually exactly the same concept of dimension that we were talking about earlier when we were, when we were describing geometrical objects with parameters. So for example, a plane through zero will be a two-dimensional subspace, just like our planes were previously two-dimensional because they had two parameters. And a line through zero will be a one-dimensional subspace, um, just like our lines before had one parameter in them. So what we are going to do, or what we're going to want to do is to find a basis given a subspace. Or maybe we want to get some caffeine in, our, in ourselves so that we can actually start thinking straight again. <laughs> so let's remember where it is we're at. What I want to be able to do, if you give me a subspace, it's probably going to be specified as the span of some set of vectors. So you've given me the subspace, how are you going to give it to me? You're going to give me a bunch of vectors that span it. So my job, or what I want to do next, is to find that smallest set of vectors that spans the same space as the big set that you gave me. All right, now how are we going to do this? Well, the answer is matrices to the rescue. Um, so we're going to attack this kind of 
in the next video, but let's just end this one with a bit of an observation because it, can it turns out we can use all of our knowledge about matrices and reduced racial on forms to answer lots and lots of questions of this nature. So let's just start with a basic um, two by three matrix, one, three, negative one, and three, one, two for row two. Now, we are kind of going to think of the rows of this matrix as vectors that are on their sides. So when we do a row operation, what we're really doing is taking a linear combination of those sideways vectors or those rows. So if we were doing our Gaussian elimination, the first row operation we'd do is row two becomes row two minus three row one. So this is just replacing row two with a linear combination of rows one and two. Now the cool thing is, no matter what row operations we actually do, we'll always be looking at linear combinations of the rows, which will turn out to be linear combinations of the original rows. So if we pretend that our vectors that we're interested in are actually rows of a matrix, our row operations will be really useful for helping us find our basis. So I think though, we're going to take a break and we'll come at this problem fresh in the next video. So take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. See you later.